We are ready to continue with the message on the sanctuary. So let's have a short prayer before we start. Father in heaven, as we continue with looking at the symbols in the sanctuary and the deeper meanings of these symbols, will you enlighten our minds? Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I promise that I will list all the symbols that, that we see in the sanctuary and put a meaning to it according to Scripture. So all of these symbols come from Scripture. I have searched. And something I want to share with you personally, as you study the Bible, and especially if you want to unravel symbols in the Bible, it's taking you to the whole Bible. Be aware. To unravel symbolism, you need to find as many texts as possible on that symbol that speaks about the same word. Usually get it in a concordance. Um, Cruden's concordance, Strong's concordance. I have an app that you can use. Then when you find all the verses on that specific word, like for instance, lion. What is the meaning of the lion in the Bible? Now you can have two meanings. All right? You have the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then you have the roaring lion, which is Satan, right? Right, in the book of Peter. Then, when you come to things like that, what do you decide? Which one is which one? Then the context tells you which one fits. That's very, very important. So, if you then have all the texts on, the, on a line, then you have to start reading them and sort them out. Which one tells me what is the deeper meaning of the symbol of a line? So, you can sort the text till you have all the texts. Read then all the texts. Say, wow, he has a picture coming out of all these texts of what the lion means. This is how you study the symbolism in the Bible. Does it make sense? But find as many texts as possible on that word. And usually you want the same symbolism, the same language, and the same subject. Otherwise you're comparing apples with pears. You need to compare apples with apples. Right. So what I've tried to do is, I have to, I've got in my mind, right through the sanctuary, looking at every metal, everything that is in the sanctuary, and then find the meaning of it. All right, so it's about 10 slides, I think. So let's go through them. In some places, I will explain a little bit. But some are easy, and you know them already. White, you know already. So let's look at the colors first. White is the righteousness of Jesus, or purity. There's all the text that you want. Blue is found in the book of Numbers very clearly. The Israelites also had to put a blue uh, fringe on their garments to remind them to walk in the statues of God, in the commandments of God. So it, it is a symbol of the commandments. And then red or scarlet is the symbolism of the blood of Christ. The purple symbolizes royalty or kingship. Right? is usually the combination then of the two colors of blue and red. Gives us the purple that is uh, symbolizing the kingship of Jesus. And as we go through these, I want you to take your mind to Jesus because every one of these symbols is pointing to Jesus. That is fascinating. Right? Jesus' purity. He kept his father's commandments. The blood that he shed. The purple, he's the king. Remember the purple robe was put on him when he was crucified and so forth. And green, the green color suggests um, life, a new life in Christ, right? Black is usually um, um, when somebody is mourning or dying or whatever, uh, the black cloth. But this is actually meaning the humanity of Jesus, all right? Jesus took sin for us. He became sin for us. Um, the black, blue seal skins on top of the sanctuary, represented that specifically. And it's the opposite of purity. Let's look at the, the metals. Gold denotes the faith that works by love. Remember the Laosian church? Need to buy gold purified in the fire. That gold is the faith that works by love. That talks about a pure character, a holy character. What about the walls? 
of the sanctuary building symbolize salvation, protection by keeping the commandments. So when we keep the commandments, those are protection. The walls are usually protecting walls around cities and so forth is, is for salvation. So silver suggests redemption based on the perfect obedience of the Savior. So the silver footings that is there in the sanctuary where the boards were on is suggesting the obedience part uh, because of the obedience of Christ. Copper or bronze or brass symbolize durability, strength, invincibility and endurance and the, in the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay? And also meaning the humanity of Jesus, the copper. The same with the wood. Symbolically attests to our Lord's fragile human nature, vulnerable to ravages of time. So that is the wood in Scripture. Um, the wood was then covered with all bronze or with copper, right, in the sanctuary. The crown, it's also easy to see the crown around the borders, just means um, the throne of God, right? Um, usually glory and honor as well. The horns on the altar is very important. The horns symbolize strength of salvation. The strength to overcome sin through the blood of Christ. Remember the blood only in the sin offering was put on the horns of the altar outside and the horns of the altar inside. Many times in scripture people went to the horns of the altar and held the horns. All right, As safety and salvation that they find in the horns of the altar. Another important verse is, I didn't put that on there, it's interesting, I need to put it on there. Is in the book of Habakkuk, where it says the second coming of Jesus, Habakkuk 3 verse 3 and 4, talks about the second coming of Jesus, there's horns coming out of his hands. Now if you go to the original word, it means light beams coming out of his hands. But it describes it as horns in the old language. And those are the places where Jesus was crucified. And then oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit's grace. Actually, many people say the symbol of oil is the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, it's technically actually the grace that the Holy Spirit imparts to us. So the extra oil of those virgins is because they appropriated the grace of the Holy Spirit imparted to them to live an uh, uh, obedient life. Incense, of course, is prayer and intercession. And then the fire, blood, uh, the fire, water, and blood is also all symbols of purification and cleansing. The garments, we already spoke about the garments, are symbolizing righteous. You're putting on a righteous garment or you're putting on salvation. The mitre on the head or the diadem, right, on the head of the priest, symbolize a crown of glory and salvation. When, when it was taken off, the glory was removed from the person. So it's glory and honor when, when you have a mitre upon the head. The ephod, symbol of inner beauty. Okay? That ephod was the color of purple, blue, and scarlet, and gold, and uh, the white linen. So that all symbolized the, uh, the inner beauty of the person. Of Christ, of course, first. And the breastplate, the symbol of judgment and righteousness. And keeping God's people close to, to his heart. Okay, that's what the breastplate is all about. Um, it relates also to the new Jerusalem. The girdle, the sash that was put around in the different colors of blue, purple, scarlet, and white. Is of course, um, when Paul says, put the, the truth around the loins, right? So around the waist, symbolizing blessing and strength of truth. Righteousness and faithfulness that's bound around it. But it also symbolized how God binds His people close to Him to be a witness, praise, and glory to Him. Then what about the pomegranates? That was a difficult one. When I studied the books on Songs of Solomon, this is where I found the beauty of the symbol of the pomegranates. Because pomegranates are not used in Scripture very often. But when it's used, it's used in the sanctuary and in the book Songs of Solomon. So there's a connection between the sanctuary and the book Songs of Solomon as well. And pomegranates give us a connection. So it symbolizes abundance and blessing. Right? 
and it was usually in the colors blue, scarlet, purple, um, and white. The pomegranates were made that color. I don't think it was white. I may make a mistake here, but it was definitely blue, scarlet, and purple at the bottom of the blue um, robe. So it symbolized abundance and blessing. In, in a tradition from the Jews, they believed the symbolizing of the pomegranate that had 613 pips in it. I don't know if they counted them. Because there were 613 statues and laws in the Torah. So they believed that symbolized the Torah. And that is why it was there. Now, I don't have that from Scripture, all right? But that was something coming from the Jewish tradition. Then the bells is symbolizing testifying of God's goodness, abundance, and blessing. So the bells that are ringing is people talking about God's goodness. That's what it means. The precious stones, symbol of God's righteous people. The onyx stones on the shoulders symbolize God's support and guidance, all right? And governance, right, on the shoulder of, of God's people. And then the Urim and Thummim means light. The, the Urim means light. And the Thummim means uh, perfect or innocent, respectively. So that was to help making judgment, right. But it's still two, two uh, um, stones, which represents God's righteous people. So God was making a judgment through that. The veils of the gates, we already spoke about. Through Jesus' humanity, we enter into salvation, and salvation will be complete, right, through the humanity of Christ. And it's also called the gate, gates of righteousness. So as we walk through these gates, we're moving from faith to faith, from righteousness to righteousness in, in their steps. The pillars, very interesting, symbolize the ministers and the church upholding truth. So many times we speak about the pillars of truth. All right, the pillars of truth. So it actually represents people, leaders, that uphold truth in God's word, in God's church. All right, they are the pillars. Um, I just want to know if there's something else I need to say there. All right. So something very interesting is there's 60, 60 pillars uh, on the outer wall. So it represents, those pillars represents the cloud of witnesses. That the Bible talks about. So each one of those pillars represents us as people. We are the cloud of witnesses if we have faith in Jesus and His righteousness. The white fence is the righteousness of Jesus. Right? That was without sin. And the different animals that were chose for sacrifices. Why a bullock? The bullock symbolized strength and readiness to bear burdens. That was Christ. The ram or the lamb symbolized gentleness. Meekness, submissiveness, that was Jesus. The goat, usually symbol of wicked, wickedness and sin, right? That is not valuable at all. Jesus became sin for us. That is why we see that sometimes a lamb was used, sometimes a ram was used, or a lamb. Sometimes the goat was used. Are you with me? A different, sometimes the, the sparrow was used, or a dove was used, or... And each one of them had the characteristics and why God wanted to use that as a sacrifice. The pigeons and the doves symbolize har harmlessness, peace, reconciliation, also mourning for sin. Sparrows, the humanity, um, um, and our daily simple trust in God's grace, right, in God's care. Then the different parts of the animal, the head of the animal symbolize man's will or thoughts. Faith and trust. God is the sorry. Uh, God is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church. The legs of the animal symbolize man's daily walk and strength for obedience. The inward parts of the animal symbolize man's inner thoughts and affections toward God, right? And we see that in 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 the verse um, in Psalms 40, verse 8. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my, my heart. That is an amazing text because it talks about Jesus. And it says that he wants to do the will of God. That means it's in him. It's in his inward parts. The law is written in his heart. The fat of the animal, right? The fat is a symbol of sin. 
Or in another context, it means abundance. Right? I mean, if you say, oh, look at that guy. He's fat, man. Well, today we see he's unhealthy, but it means there's abundance. I mean, you can see he's enjoying his life, right? It's abundance. But it's also a symbol of sin. So the sin was removed from all the sacrifices and burned on the altar. Sin is removed out of our lives by the grace of Christ. Through the sacrifice of Christ. So Jesus became sin for us. Ashes, also very important. The ashes, following the ashes, is finally, it's finality, completion, mourning, purification. All these are symbols of the ashes. Depends on the context that you find yourself in there as well. It has the idea of it is finished. The idea of it is finished. I don't know if you've ever looked at this word, it is finished in Scripture. Do you know there's three places in Scripture where the word is used, it is finished, or it is done. That's when Jesus died on the cross, first time. Jesus says, it is finished. That means part of the atonement was done. Something happened on the cross that was done. Okay? Then there's something else that need to comp that need to be completed in the intercession of Jesus. And when probation closes, right, in Revelation chapter 15, 16, again, it is done when probation is closed. So another part was finished. The gospel was finished, proclaiming. The mystery of God was finished. Then, when everything is finished and sin is eradicated, I think it's in Revelation 21, it says, it is done. The new heavens and new earth is created. Then sin is completely removed. Can you see the three stages in which sin is removed? On the cross, the shame and condemnation of sin is removed at the cross. At the close of probation, what is removed? The power of sin in our lives is removed. There's no more power of sin in our lives. We are ready to be translated. And then the final eradication of sin, when the new heaven and new earth is created, it is done. These are the three stages of it is done. So I, I was trying to get all of the symbols, and of course I didn't put certain things in here which are already done, like the water and the water laver and things like that. I already spoke about that. But these are the, all the things I could think of in the sanctuary that is symbolic. And every single one point to all our salvation or what Jesus is doing for our salvation. And point to Him as our Savior. May it be a blessing to you as it was a blessing to me. So we are next meeting we are going to talk about um, the sanctuary and prophecy. Let's, let's quickly pray. And then I will answer some questions. Father we thank you for leading us through these symbols. And as we contemplate these symbols that our minds will go to be Jesus interceding for us in his beauty of his wonderful character. In Jesus' name, amen.